Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. It's, it's really my pleasure and delight and honor to welcome Roger Cohen today. Uh, Roger Cohen, it doesn't need to be said, is a, is a renowned columnist for the New York Times. I don't know about you, but for me, it's, I could tell you where I am every Wednesday morning and every Saturday morning. I'm reading Roger's phenomenal and phenomenally provocative columns. Uh, Roger Cohen joined the New York Times in 1990, uh, where he served as foreign correspondent for over a decade. And uh, then he became acting foreign editor on 9-11, 2001. Or you became acting foreign editor the day before, perhaps. It was announced the day before. Announced. What a first day on the job, and then subsequently became formally the foreign editor of the New York Times. In 2009, uh, Roger was named a columnist for the Times, and as I said, his column appears every Wednesday and Saturday. Throughout his career, uh, which has also included periods at the Wall Street Journal and at, at Reuters, as well as the New York Times, uh, Roger's reported from a variety of global locales, the Middle East, South America, Europe, um, some of our students working on Latin America had the pleasure of, of meeting with Roger earlier today. So his expertise ranges across many different domains and also many different geographies. Uh, Roger is the author of four books. I recommend them all. Soldiers and Slaves, American POWs Trapped by the Nazis' Final Gamble, uh, Hearts Grown Brutal, Sagos of Sarajevo, In the Eye of the Storm, which is a biography of Norman Schwarzkopf, um, and his own family memoir, The Girl from Human Street, A Jewish Family Odyssey. Um, Rogers received many, many awards. We were joking before about how long this introduction can be. I, I won't mention them all or, or, or very many of them, but I'll just, just a couple of the most recent ones. Um, uh, the Society of Publishers in Asia's Excellence. Uh, Roger is a recipient, not once but twice recently, of the Society of Publishers in Asia's Excellence in Opinion Writing Award, and he's also recently received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the New Century Foundation's International Media Council. Uh, Roger today will be speaking on the topic of American fracture, the end of the American century, and a shared American language. Roger, I turn the podium to you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, thank you for the invitation to Brown. It's a great pleasure to see my friend Daniel Smith here sitting in the front row. Uh, we met in paradise. We met when we both had fellowships uh, in Bellagio, Italy, to the Rockefeller Foundation. And if, if any of you can ever get that gig, uh, go for it. Um, we played tennis uh, every afternoon and then picked figs from the trees. And uh, <laughs> I never got a set of him, but. I'll forgive you. <laughs> um, it's my first visit here. Um, I've never been to Providence, um, such a wonderful name. Um, I've never strolled under the elms. Uh, I'm not sure if they're still there or still eat at the rock. I've never watched your legendary football team um, or your lacrosse team, for that matter. Um, uh, I'm a close friend of uh, a woman from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Sarah Cleveland, who was in high school in the early 1980s and learned in 11th grade about the Civil War. And her teacher listed 14 reasons for the outbreak of the Civil War. And slavery was not one of them. Uh, she went on to Brown um, and a Rhodes Scholarship and a great subsequent career. And here, providentially, uh, discovered what the civil rights movement in her home state had been. Uh, as this illustrates, uh, a liberal arts education is a great thing. Um, never underestimate the privilege of receiving it. It can open eyes. It can change a life. It can bring home the sacredness of truth and the price of deception. It can help consolidate your moral being your moral being, that's the heart of it. Uh, American Fracture is my subject, and we meet today at one of those breaking points in the life of a republic. Who could watch that pouting, elaborately quaffed man standing the other day at a podium behind the seal of the President of the United States of America, mocking, mocking 
the survivor of a sexual assault and not feel nausea. Nausea, la nausée, as you may know, was the title of a novel written in the 1930s by Jean-Paul Sartre, one of whose main themes was that life is meaningless without personal commitments that give it meaning. Who could watch those cheering, riveted Americans in the backdrop to that scornful man and not feel disquiet, some faint echo of the 20th century's darkest hours? Who could not be reminded again of Benjamin Franklin's words in 1787 when asked what form of government had been adopted in the nascent United States? A republic, if you can keep it. Now, I'm a naturalized American. I really want to respect my president. I don't want to speak ill of him. Um, but with this president, um, despite my best efforts, um, that has proved impossible. Uh, president Trump has taken a sledgehammer to America's moral core, its values and responsibilities. This is what I believe. This is what I write. I will not shut up as Steve Bannon once urged the press to do, nor will my colleagues at what President Trump likes to call the fake news failing New York Times. Of that, I can assure you. As I've written, I think the Brett Kavanaugh hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee have been a raw search test for America's tribes. We're all in our ideological silos these days, our ideological chasms with the bridges between them growing uh, ever more faint and narrow. They saw what they wanted to see. For Kavanaugh's supporters, his rage was as good a primal scream for threatened white male privilege as may be imagined. For me, Christine Blasey Ford's 100% rang more true than his. This was not a criminal trial. It was a job interview. He failed the job interview. Who would want this injudicious man seemingly pieced together on a foundation of repressed anger and circumscribed privilege. This man who quite plausibly, and this was not a criminal trial, was the teenage drunk near suffocating Dr. Ford, occupying a place for life on the highest court in the land. Well, ladies and gentlemen, tens of millions of Americans would. This is where we are. There's not much common ground left, and truth is under assault. Hannah Arendt wrote that the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, i.e. the reality of experience, and the distinction between true and false, i.e. the standards of thought, no longer exist. Since he took office, according to the Washington Post, that other newspaper, Trump has issued more than 4,200 false or misleading claims. That's about seven a day. So falsehood is now the standard fare of Americans. There's nothing accidental about this, I believe. President Trump's aim is to foster disorientation. Disorientation favors rulers with authoritarian or autocratic sympathies because they want to portray themselves as the sole font of truth. Remember Trump at the Republican Convention in 2016. I am your voice. The United States has never had, never had a president who, keep who keeps telling Americans they cannot trust the institutions that form the checks and balances of our governance. Don't trust a free press. It's fake. Don't trust the judiciary or the ju Justice Department or the Attorney General. It or he has a hostile agenda. Just trust me. This message emanates daily from the right White House, and I think it aims to drag us down the rabbit hole where two plus two equals five. Take the word honesty itself. There are now, in my experience, two definitions of truth in the United States. The first, and I suspect it's the one favored by most people in this room, the first is that a truthful statement is one that conforms to facts. By that standard, President Trump is a serial liar. The second is that truth is telling it like it is, 
or speaking in a direct, unvarnished way without regard to political correctness. By this measure, for his supporters, Donald Trump is the most honest president we've ever had. And I've heard many Americans tell me this. He's done what he said he would do. He's moved the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. He's trashed the nuclear deal with Iran. He's torn up the climate accord in Paris. He does what he says he will do. He's the most honest president we've ever had. Now, America needs the conversations across ideological lines. It's not having. It's not having them because it's difficult even to agree on language any longer, the meaning, for example, of honesty, of truth. We have no shared lexicon. Climate change, sustainability, justice, self-reliance, gender, coal, guns, God, the new verb, to me too. Words like these are now tribal detonators. They are badges of identity about which discussion is near impossible. Tolerance and restraint, those essential ingredients of democracy, are drowned. Day by lying day, they wither. I believe passionately that the sign, the mark of any healthy society is its capacity for civilized disagreement. And that capacity in our democracy, I believe, is under threat. I firmly believe that beyond all the mili military bluster we've heard, the most dangerous assault from our president is on truth itself. It's hard to remember Friday what lie you were outraged by Monday. Outrage fatigue sets in. I recall the first time I shrugged. President Trump talked about two congratulatory calls he'd received, one from the head of the Boy Scouts and one from the president of Mexico. There was only one issue, as the president of Mexico and the head of the Boy Scouts quickly pointed out, these phone calls had never taken place. They never happened. And then Sarah Huckabee Sanders was asked in the White House whether the president had lied by inventing these phone calls. And she said, well, no, I wouldn't exactly call it a lie. No, it wasn't, wasn't really that. And I remember listening to this. And it was the first time I shrugged. I felt, OK, what else is new? My president is lying. Please, ladies and gentlemen, don't shrug. Um, down that path, I think, lies disaster. Um, I don't think where the president wants to go is much of a secret. He models his New York apartment on Versailles, the palace where these words are emblazoned, le roi gouverne par lui-même. The king governs by himself. L'état, c'est moi. The state is, is me. Xi Jinping turns himself into an emperor for life, and our president suggests we should try that sometime. He says that when the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, who's now a great personality and funny, and what was that thing in Singapore? Was that UNESCO? Was that the theater of the absurd? Was that the unbearable lightness of being? What are we supposed to think? The president meets with the leader of North Korea, whose pursuit of a nuclear program has been going on for decades, and announces on the basis of nothing, nothing really, that it's all over. Everything is fine. Um, and he says that when Kim Jong-un speaks, his people set up at attention. And he says, I want my people to do the same. Now, of course, you might say to me, these are throwaway lines, jokes, attempts at jokes. If it were not for the fact that from the Saudi love fest on, his first trip overseas, um, Trump's attraction to dictators has been so consistent. And his disdain for many allied democratic leaders like Angela Merkel in Germany had not been equally so. This is a president who favors many of America's foes over its friends. This, I think, is serious. More serious, however, is the dismantling through repetitive falsehood of moral beings. Now, coming up to Brown, I've been thinking also of another friend who studied at Brown, uh, the late Richard Holbrook, um, diplomat, patriot, peacemaker, and often just plain impossible guy. I don't know how familiar Holbrook is to you. The 20th century and its lessons are fading fast. I got to know Holbrook in Bosnia, where I covered the war he put an end to 
a great American diplomatic achievement. In truth, that peace of 1995 was ugly, a, a bitter compromise. But when you've seen, as I had covering the war there for two years, the deaths of 100,000 people in Europe, an accord like Dayton that silences the guns, that leads to a situation where not another life and not another gun is fired in anger, the silencing of those guns is still precious. The perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. A diplomatic peace between foes is a bit like a successful divorce, the least bad way to separate and stop attritional warfare. There's not much, there's nothing beautiful about it except the closing of a chapter and the opening of another. Now Holbrook died eight years ago and I've just read in galley form George Packer's very fine biography of him, Our Man, to be published in December. I was actually in tears at the end of it. And why was I in tears? Because I grasped how lonely Holbrook, then the special envoy for Afghanistan and Pakistan, had been. His private life in turmoil, mistrusted by and estranged from the Obama administration. His ideas about American power, its unique capacity to forge a more open and democratic world, already somehow quaint. Like the late John McCain, Holbrook had lived through the zenith of post-war American power, had served in Vietnam, had no illusions about American failings, and yet always saw America's word as a pledge in the cause of liberty. That in the end is what global security since 1945 rested on, America's word, the word given to allies in treaty commitments in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. The credibility of that word, and I would argue its foundation in morality. If I, a naturalized American, did not do what my uncle and father did, come from distant South Africa to join the war effort in Europe, the fight to preserve liberty, it was, in the end, because of America's word. I've tried never to forget that. America is an idea, or it's nothing. When an American president dallies with dictators, scoffs at the American commitment to human rights, abandons a rules-based international order, treats alliances as zero-sum questions of cash, and devotes himself to blurring the distinction between truth and falsehood, America, in some essential way, ceases to be. Hence, it should be no surprise that the end of the American century has coincided with the debasement of truth, the moment when America's word became worthless. Pax Americana died with the evisceration of America's word. May it rest in peace. It had a good run. And to those who say, Yankees get out, usually in my experience, asking in the same breath if they could take a child with them to get an education at a place like Brown, I say, careful what you wish for. Of course, flux is in the nature of things. Even before President Trump, even at the moment Holbrook died, the world had changed. China has risen, India is rising, Western democracy is in a state of upheaval. Technology, twin-souled like Goethe's Faust, has changed the world for good and ill. We like, we dislike, we follow, we unfollow, we broadcast our lives, we fall silent, adrenaline rushes, status anxiety ensues. Contemporary life is an endless experiment in global direct democracy. We're networked. More than two billion people use Facebook. So do we really need representative democracy? Is it not just a means to give the powerful and the affluent the means to control our lives? These are important questions and not simple ones. But they shouldn't mask the fact that President Trump, through his abandonment of our values and moral core and our alliances, has handed the world to the likes of Putin, Xi, and Mohammed bin Salman, and so undercut the freedom on which any decent world must be built. So, how did we get here? This is a strange moment, five decades after May 1968, and I know what a moment at Brown uh, 1968 was, and 1969 when 
Henry Kissinger, I believe, came here and gave the commencement speech, and Brown students stood up and turned their backs on him. Almost three decades after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a great reactionary tide, in contrast to those moments when freedom rose up, is unfurling. I didn't expect it, perhaps none of us did. My life until recently had been about the spread, uneven, faltering, but pretty constant, of liberty, democratic governance, the rule of law, and pluralism. No longer nationalism, nativism, xenophobia in various forms are on the rise. Liberal democracy itself, with its belief in openness, diversity, and multiculturalism, is derided. The forgotten people of globalization, those in the hinterland, what the French call the peripherie, the periphery, those whose world has remained local, those dying for something different, have raised their voices to say, enough, assez. Of what, exactly? Well, enough of what intellectual and financial elites told them was acceptable and indeed inevitable in the age of homo technologicus. Enough of precariousness, disappearing factories, obscene and growing inequality, stagnant middle-class wages over decades, the impunity of the powerful, great recessions for which, strangely, nobody is responsible, nobody is to blame, and cultural alienation. History, Trump voters have reminded us, can lurch. Certainly, it doesn't glide to a curtain fall in a universal liberal democratic love-in. I don't believe it will be easy to dislodge Donald Trump from the White House. I believe he is quite likely to be a two-term president because I don't think the tide I just described is, is, has reached its zenith yet. All the noise he makes, all the foolish things he says and tweets shouldn't mask the fact that President Trump is a symptom, not a cause. He reflects and reinforces a global counter-revolutionary moment a reaction to what Angela, Merkel, Angela Merkel's cry of being, as she put it, alternative los, without alternatives. I can't do anything differently. Well, the counter-revolutionaries insist there are alternatives, alter alternatives to openness, to mass migration, to free trade, to secularism, to Europe's ever closer union, to the legalization of same-sex marriage, to gender as a spectrum, to diversity, to Black Lives Matter, to Islam in Christian Europe, to renewable sources of energy, to perm permissiveness. They are angry. They feel they have the wind at their backs. Note the again in Trump's winning election slogan, this is about an attempted restoration. Once upon a time, we won wars. White men ruled. A factory worker in Michigan had a couple of quad bikes. And marriage was between a man and a woman. It's about going back, resisting economic, cultural, technological, gender, and demographic change. In the wired metropolis, the malcontents are not well understood often. They're sometimes treated with a form of contempt. Hillary Clinton's deplorables, Barack Obama's workers who cling to guns and religion. I think it's worth remembering that nobody was ever persuaded by being made to feel stupid. Mutual incomprehension characterizes our national fracture. And it's not ours alone. I spent time, some time this year in Hungary and Poland I was last there just as they were emerging in the early 90s from the Soviet Imperium. They were societies full of hope, the thirst for th freedom, thirst also for the security and stability of the European Union and NATO. What a difference a quarter century makes. Today, Viktor Orban, the right-wing Hungarian prime minister and sometime combatant against Bolshevism, declares, the danger is threatening us from the West. This danger comes from politicians in Brussels, Berlin, and Paris. For Orban and for leaders in Poland and now perhaps the Czech Republic, these cities full of immigrants are the locus of Europe's cultural suicide. The West is the place where family, church, nation, and traditional notions of marriage and gender go to die. And I think the Orban blueprint has echoes here which I'm sure will not have escaped you. Like 
Orban, the president, calls our justice system a laughingstock. He dismisses the media, with the conspicuous exception of Fox News, as enemies of the people, totalitarian phrase, and takes on one of our great companies, Amazon, because its owner is also the owner of the Washington Post. He demonizes Mexican, uh, Mexicans and Muslims, among others. Crony capitalism, like Orban, well, to some degree. Nostalgia for a mystical past, like Orban, make America great again. Overturning checks and balances, well, the presidency reimagined as the bully pulpit of a mass movement. I rehearse all this because I think Donald Trump is by instinct much closer to an Orban or a Kaczynski in Poland than, say, to Angela Merkel or Emmanuel Macron. The same forces of anxiety, fear, and anger, all turbocharged by bots, Russian or not, fake news across the internet, a blood bloodthirsty immigrants, brought Trump to the Oval Office. He continues to play on them, as we saw in the foul scene I alluded to at the beginning of this talk. I think Trump's great insight and he has formable instincts, was that he could be the vehicle of this anger. He grasped that nativism and xenophobia were ripe for a rerun. Well, I've tried over the last 18 months to get out to Kentucky, Arizona, Indiana, Colorado, upstate New York, among other places, because really you don't learn much about the Trump phenomenon, and it is a phenomenon, in New York City. You tire of going to dinners where the competition is over who can come up with the funniest line about Trump's absurdity. There is a phenomenon, and I think journalists have to get out there, get their feet on the ground, bear witness, and try to understand. Um, we have a partisan problem in this country. I think we also have a contempt problem. There's an ugly racist fringe to Trump's support, no question. The white supremacists, the xenophobes, that fringe is there, and it's loathsome. But there are also millions of decent, smart Americans who just view the world differently and felt, I guess, that they were losing some part of their country's essence, that Obama meant what he said during the 2008 campaign about fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Here's one voice from Republican Trump country that I heard. People have to choose between heating their homes, buying food, or buying health care, and you want them to worry about the survival of the planet or transgender stuff? I respect business and I distrust government. That's the American way. I don't want illegal immigrants taking our jobs. I don't like liberals who shop at Whole Foods, talking down their noses at me because I shop at Walmart. White lives matter too, you know. We lost our discipline and our moral code in this country, so we need Trump to shake things up. And here's a Democrat in Colorado whom I spoke to recently. Why am I a Democrat? I'm a Democrat because we need immigrants. There are farms around here that can't find a labor force thanks to Trump. I hate the idea of a wall. That's not what America's about. I'm a Democrat because I support Roe v. Wade. If you've ever seen a 13-year-old having a baby, and I did once as a hospital intern, that sets your feelings. But I'll tell you, I'm also a Democrat disgusted with the Democratic Party. I guess that's what I really wanted to tell you. How can the party have lost touch so completely with how to talk to people in small towns across America? Take the environment. Like I said, my dad worked in the mines, so maybe that influences me. But you can't take jobs away out of environmental concerns and give the impression that you don't give a damn about creating new jobs. The Democratic Party is seen around here as a job destroyer. You've got a bureaucracy at the EPA regulating a coal-fired power plant out of existence. And when all those jobs go and your tax base with it, the party doesn't care. Or health care, the number one concern of people around here. Around here, Obamacare is a disaster. The insurance companies have pulled out of rural areas. And when there's only one left, guess what? Premiums go way up. Nobody can afford it. Some people are scared to get a job because they think they'll lose their Medicaid if they do. It's all screwed up. But the Democratic Party is too busy with its special interest groups, its gender spectrums, and its Me Too revolution devouring its own to speak out about this mess. You've got some of the worst found funded schools in the country in this area. 
Some have gone to four-day weeks because there's no tax money to support them and it costs too much to run school buses. Imagine telling parents of kids in all those affluent, metropolitan, democratic strongholds, sorry, four-day school week. I can hear the collective squeal, but I don't see the Democratic Party owning the education issue. I thought the Democratic Party stood for social justice. Not around here it doesn't. My neighbors are Republicans. That's how it is in small town America. It's tough to answer them when they say the Democrats are taking our jobs, our guns, our American self-reliance, and replacing it with handouts to every interest group with some gripe. Why have we Democrats let our fun founding American myths of can-do optimism, free speech, and individualism get away from us? I think that spells defeat. That's a Democrat speaking. We need to think deeply and without illusions or arrogance about the chasm in this country. I don't like the word populism. I don't use it, really. I don't like it because its meaning seems to me to be blurry. And if there's one quality the word populism has, it's that it's freighted with contempt. The populists. They're all those people out there that we're not really going to bother to try to understand. Now, this chasm is one to which Fox News heard reinforcing social media algorithms, you know, that detect your sympathies and immediately channel only news that corresponds to those political sympathies to you. Bots and trolls, Republican debunking of reason and science, the money of Koch and Mercer, liberal arrogance, rightist racism, <laughs> and spreading technological autism have ushered us. A lot of forces are playing in favor of the separation of Americans into distinct tribes with no way any longer or limited ways any longer to speak to each other. Imagine what's going to happen when this confirmation process ends, either with the confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh, which I deeply oppose, uh, or, or his nomination being blocked. Either way, on one side or the other, I think his confirmation is likely, um, and I don't say that obviously with any enthusiasm, just looking at it with as cold an eye as I can. Um, in that event, there will be an explosion of anger um, on the Democratic side. And if, by some chance, uh, he does not become, and again, I don't think he should. He's an injudicious man, as he showed the nation a few days back. Um, if he should become a justice on the Supreme Court, um, or if, sorry, if he, if he does not, then, well, <laughs> the, the Republican side and, and the president will not hesitate to whipple this up as much as he can. Uh, so we're at a, you know, a very delicate moment, as I began by saying. And I think the structures that help preserve community and dignity and power among working class people, labor unions, have been systematically eroded. Increasingly, there's nowhere to be and nowhere to work that is not shift work at a chain. And absent anything else, some white blue collar workers decided to unify around whiteness, and Trump became their mouthpiece. As I've suggested, I think the Democratic Party has a lot of work to do. It still has a contempt issue. The liberal complacency that holds that Trump supporters just need to be educated is self-defeating. I don't think that coming across as the party of angry, identity-obsessed interest groups, or coming across as that to the exclusion of other issues, interest groups gathered around race or sexual orientation and so on, I don't think that will carry the day in 2020, nor will mere Trump hatred. The same old, same old won't work. Peter Drucker, a shrewd Dutchman, once observed that the greatest danger in turbulent times is not the turbulence itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. Not the turbulence itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. We need to think again about liberal democracy. The Democratic Party needs to get out and work on those issues I just spoke about, health, education, energy, inequality. 
Look to purple state America, not blue state coastal America, for a candidate who's grappling with the country's toughest issues, making those tough compromises I talked about at the beginning, and is strong on can-do, down-to-earth values. I like John Hickenlooper, governor of Colorado, and I like the words of Alexandra Arbeleda, a lawyer in Phoenix and a friend, a Democrat in a Republican county, who told me last year, you have to be more receptive and see where people who don't think like you come from. Most people are concerned about climate change, but where in Telluride that might be priority number one, with the Republicans it's down the list, so you have to adjust. Instead of talking about sustainability and climate change, words that set them off, talk pragmatically about drought conservation plans. Persuade them that increasing irrigation efficiency at the time of the longest drought in recorded history on the Colorado River system benefits everyone from farms to downstream city users. It's doable, but you have to curb the arrogance that's out there. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. Perhaps you know Samuel Beckett's line, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. I was thinking of it the other day in Athens, gazing at the Parthenon from the rooftop of a hotel. And what came to my mind were the two and a half millennia of human striving for a political system permitting citizens to exercise power through their votes, government of the people, by the people, for the people, as Lincoln put it. Try again, fail again, fail better. Thank you all for the small act of civic faith in showing up here today. At its best, democracy is a culture that empowers citizens to participate in shaping their fates. At its worst, it's a charade in which civic bonds erode, power accrues to the few, self-aggrandizement becomes the norm, and tolerance and restraint and decency and honor are consumed by the howling of the mob. It's Trump behind that presidential seal, baying, baying about a woman's suffering. That white citadel in Athens, like John Winthrop's City Upon a Hill, not so far from here, exhausted us, exhorts us to restore words like decency. And let's be stubborn about the sacredness of truth. There are those today on both sides of the Atlantic who are trying to turn the clock back to Europe's darkest hours. They're all about borders, real or imagined, against Islam, migrants, refugees, Jews, the European Union, the United Nations, and what they see as the pluralist international conspiracy. But let's never forget that it was precisely measures taken to construct or preserve a homogeneous society that lay at the core of the most heinous crimes of the 20th century. Post-war Europe, anchored by American power, was erected to prevent their occurrence. The illiberal trend present in the United States and in Europe represents a rejection of the core post-war insight that ever closer union meant ever expanding peace. And it wasn't a zero-sum game. The creation of the European Union wasn't a conspiracy to try to undermine or threaten the United States. No, it created a single market of a half billion people on a continent shattered by wars repeatedly through its history. And the United States and Europe, it wasn't a zero-sum game. A lot of the prosperity in this country has come from the creation of the European Union and the amount of American trade and business that has flowed that way and flowed in the other direction. Well, I believe that the United States, whatever its acute divisions today, and whatever the difficult times that are now looming, is still the country of ex pluribus unum, and still a country where the president takes an oath, not to the people, as the president actually said in his inaugural, who, as the founders knew, could become a mob, not to the people, but to the Constitution. The rule of law is our North Star, we will guard it and we will keep our republic, an inspiration to free people still the world over. We will keep our free press and our independent judiciary. In the end, I am an optimist. You know, I was 
past my infancy in South Africa and spent my childhood hearing about how the swimming pools of people like my family and comfortable suburbs of Johannesburg would be overrun and the swimming pools would turn red with blood and the 30 plus million blacks confined to miserable fetid townships out there on the horizon would of course rise up one day and much like the whites of Zimbabwe, um, the four million whites of South Africa would be driven out, my Jewish family from Lithuania included, and the black community of South Africa would claim what was theirs. Well, those swimming pools didn't turn red with blood. Um, the worst didn't happen. Um, South Africa has just survived a presidency with much more fragile institutions, has just survived a presidency, Jacob Zuma's, that in some ways I think resembles the one we have in the United States today. And so if you experience that, I think, early in your life, um, the fact that statesmanship and looking forward rather than back and deciding that a child's life is more important than vengeance for the wounds of the past, um, you, you do believe in that kind of thing. Of course, I've spent a lot of my life <laughs> in places like Bosnia and the Middle East and Israel-Palestine where nobody can be persuaded to place the lives of children above uh, vengeance um, for the wounds of the past, where the, these wounds are just refracted down through generations and how tired I grew in the Balkans of hearing what had happened to the Croats in 1132 or the great um, glorious defeat, a defeat turned into a victory of the Serbs at Kosovo Field in the 14th century and you know how tired I hear, I, I grow in, in, in Israel-Palestine of hearing uh, you know, the arguments of both sides, both of which have validity, um, but uh, of course the conflict doesn't go anywhere. So I am an optimist. Uh, I think democracy is resilient, it's stubborn, it raises our gaze, it's a system that best enshrines the unshakable human desire to be free. And I don't think that urge or the societies that best enable that are about to die in the 21st century, whatever the threats, and they are significant that we see today. And deep in the roots of democracy, you find the human heart. You find the human conscience, Senator Flakes the other day, for example, and you find the core of human morality to which I alluded at the beginning. Dictatorships with their lies, their inhabitants, not citizens. Dictatorships don't have citizens. Their inhabitants disappearing in the night trample on all this. Perhaps you know the story of the old man on his deathbed, approached by his children. Dad, they say, we were afraid to ask you this before, but that perhaps the time has come. Do you want to be buried or do you want to be cremated? And a long silence follows. Oh, I don't know, the old man says. Surprise me. American democracy will still surprise us. Difficult, angry days lie ahead. Be constant, be moral beings with a purpose that as such, observes, gives meaning to life. In conclusion, I thought I'd offer this reminder from a Polish poet, Czesław Milosz, of the nature of totalitarian ty tyranny and the power of liberty and the creative human spirit. You who wronged a simple man bursting into laughter at the crime, and kept a pack of fools around you to mix good and evil, to blur the line. Though everyone bowed down before you, saying virtue and wisdom lit your way, striking gold medals in your honor, glad to have survived another day. Do not feel safe. The poet remembers. You can kill one, but another is born. The words are written down, the deed, the date. And you'd have done better with a winter dawn, a rope and a branch bowed beneath your weight. Thank you very much.
time for questions before a reception outside. Roger, I don't know whether you want to take questions at the podium. Yeah, I'll or stay. I'll, okay. I'll stay here, I think. Probably. Love to take questions, especially from students. <coughs> in France, you kind of ran on a centrist platform. You mentioned taking over as well, as a blue governor in a red state. Yeah. Do you feel like that's a path forward to kind of reconciliate these two sides of American politics that are very partisan and stuff? It's an interesting question. I mean, the Macron phenomenon was amazing, as you know. I mean, he, he'd been in the Socialist Party and he created this movement, En Marche. Uh, and, uh, and he won, and uh, it's a pretty amazing phenomenon. I mean, Hickenlooper is pretty much told me when I saw him maybe a month ago that, that he's running, you know, but he's running in the Democratic Party. I mean, I think he's going to run for the, for the nomination. Um, and yeah, I find it interesting because he's, uh, he's a politician, you know, who's, who's dealing with tough energy issues, you know, trade-offs, um, who's dealt with, um, you know, who's dealing with a purple state. With, uh, you know, which is split roughly down the middle, 50-50. And um, you can be somewhere like, you know, Telluride, which is overwhelmingly Democrat, and then you go 80 miles down the road to Grand Junction, and uh, it voted 74% Trump. Um, and it, in a way, it's, it's much more interesting to report in a state like that than certainly in New York City. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know about, I mean, I, I mean, you know, you're young and idealistic and, uh, uh, and talented, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, would you put your energy behind a, a third party movement? Do you think that uh, is, is a viable way forward? I mean, of course, we have the Ross Perot example. I, I don't know how, you know, viable that is with, or doable that is within the American uh, political system. Um, I mean, I know Bloomberg uh, had considered it. Um, it looks more like, I mean, he said, declared he cannot run as a Republican because the Republican Party has largely become the Trump Party. I mean, it just folded. Um, you know, one of the great acts of spinelessness in, in American history, <laughs> uh, I would argue. And uh, so, um, you know, if there's enough money, if somebody has enough money out there, maybe maybe it's doable. I, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and of course we have a president who is doing his best to, I mean, he's governing as the leader of a, of a faction, sometimes a mob. He's not, I think, even attempting to govern. I mean, perhaps some people would argue against me. I don't think he's attempting to govern as the president of all Americans. So of course that, you know, that whips it up even more. Um, and, you know, the Republican hypocrisy and the outrage at Democrats trying to block this nomination after Merrick Garland, it, it's just staggering. I mean, there, there's a stolen seed on, on the Supreme Court. I mean, that's, that's a fact, right? I mean, I'm appalled by the way that this phrase fact-based journalism seems to be making headway. I mean, what other kind is there? You know? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a student. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you think that a Kavanaugh nomination would result in Democratic control of the House uh, after the midterms? Uh, I think it's quite, uh, I mean, whether the Kavanaugh nomination would be the decisive factor, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the likelihood of Democratic control of the House was, was high, pretty high anyway. And uh, I think it would energize a lot of people to get out and vote, and in that sense, probably, you know, reinforces that likelihood. Um, you know, my kind of nightmare scenario is that, uh, you know, the Democrats win the House but not the Senate, and 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 some kind of impeachment proceeding is is embarked upon, and uh, we don't know what Mueller's going to 
come up with in the end. Uh, and, and then, you know, there's no conviction. There would be no conviction in the Senate. So then you have Trump going into 2020 as, you know, as, as the victim or the acquitted candidate or whatever he would then be. And, you know, again, a bit like Kavanaugh, this would, you know, rile up the tribes. And uh, I don't think that's a great, that doesn't seem to me a great scenario. And I hope there's some people thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's a couple of things, I guess. Uh, you know, I think the core support for President Trump is, is strong and solid and hasn't really wavered. And, you know, we can discuss how, what percentage of the country that is, but it's somewhere maybe in the range of 30 to 35 percent, maybe 40 percent, 30 to 30, 35 percent, let's say. You know, that's kind of a solid base. Then you have, you know, people who voted for him because they didn't want to vote for Hillary and people who uh, think it, he favors their economic interests, notably the rich. And, um, and the economy is strong, you know, very strong. People are looking at their 401ks. They like what they see. Uh, they like what they see a lot, and um, it looks quite plausible that the economy will remain strong in, uh, for another couple of years. It may not, but it's possible. So, and obviously that would favor the, the incumbent. You know, the, the other, I mean, I, as I said, I think the Democratic Party has a lot of work to do. I would be very worried by, you know, Biden candidacy or, uh, you know, he's 79 years old. Uh, I think the party needs to, needs, to, needs to think again, and I think it needs to really own issues that Americans, a lot of Americans, are really um, you know, troubled by. Um, education is, is one big one, healthcare is another, inequality is another. And then there's the, you know, the cultural gulf in the country, which, which is enormous, you know, issues that loom very large in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in cities on the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, they're, you know, they're kind of resented or, or they're not embraced and re rejected uh, in, you know, in a lot of the heartland. So um, I think, uh, you know, I think the Democratic Party should aim broad, you know, not, not sort of limit its appeal. So uh, I think a candidate from the heartland is better able to understand that and do that than uh, any candidate I've seen, whether from Boston or from from Washington or you know, or even the West Coast. And you know, and then there are people who might just, you know, there are, you know, is, is Bloomberg going to run? Is uh, uh, I mean, there's some interesting personalities out there, and of course, Trump came pretty much from nowhere, but and showed the power of, uh, of TV and of, and of having a strong image going into all this. Yes, sir. Do you see a continuation of the preponderant uh, kind of demonization of, uh, of opponents on each side? I mean, uh, it seems as though public figures of all types uh, have been uh, routinely demonized more in the last three or four uh, years, and not all. Yeah, well, I was thinking when uh, Senator McCain died that that moment during the uh, 2008 campaign where the woman gets up and says, uh, well, you know, Barack Obama's a, a Muslim and he's a Barack Hussein Obama and he's a supporter of uh, Islamists and whatever exactly she said. And, and Senator McCain, holy shit, excuse me, he actually took that... <laughs> He actually took the high road, you know. He said, I'm sorry, you know, I, you know, he's my opponent, but he's, he's a decent man, you know, and he has a family, and what he's saying, what you're saying is not, not true. And, 
I mean, I, you know, people in the Republican Party like Dick Luger and others, I mean, you know, there used to be a very significant element of moderate Republicans, you know, deeply invested in, in America's role in the world, in a rules-based world order, in the Atlantic Alliance and all that. Uh, not America first is, you know, not, not ready to go down the road that President Trump is, is proposing. And, and, you know, those people seem to be vanishing. So, you know, politicians who do take the high road, like in that instance I just mentioned, um, I think they're becoming far rarer. And I think that's why McCain's death was such, was such a moment. Uh, it, was, it was a moment in which the United States took stock of what it had lost and of where we are. And it was very telling that the President of the United States at that solemn moment could not even appear uh, at the funeral. So um, I'm, I, don't, I don't see, um, you know, I think, I think this, this mutual vilification is, has become pretty deeply encrusted. But, you know, I think Americans are good people and I think that they will respond you know, especially after this kind of immersion in, uh, in all that is kind of sullied and foul and, uh, um, you know, indecent at times. I mean, there's no limit. You know, especially after this immersion, I think if, if a candidate emerged who, who could use a different language, who could, you know, appeal to what President Obama used to call our better natures, um, uh, I don't think that the American people is unresponsive to that, you know, has, has, I think Americans are decent people. I think they, you know, they don't like having a president who is mocked around the world. And, and I think most Americans, you know, they interpret it differently. They have profound differences over things like guns, uh, and, uh, God and, same-sex marriage, uh, abortion, uh, you know, there are, there are all these wedge issues. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's not a wedge at this angle, it's a wedge at that angle. And, but, uh, you know, I still, I mean, look at President Obama's, you know, 2008 campaign itself. You know, he, there was something after the Bush years that, that ignited itself in, in the American soul, and, you know, enough enough to elect him and then elect him again. Now, you know, I had some, I had my disagreements with President Obama, but, you know, he was a good president. Um, so, uh, I'm kind of rambling, but I, I think, you know, I, I'm not entirely pessimistic on that front, although, although, you know, how that could come about, um, it's going to be a really vicious campaign in 2020. You know, I mean, tr Donald Trump, I think we'll do just about anything to win. I don't buy the argument that he'll grow bored or he doesn't really like it or he won't. He loves it. He loves, you know, he loves that performance the other night. He, he, he you know, he, he feeds off it. You know, he's everywhere. Um, it's all about Trump. I mean, the United Nations General Assembly was held last week. By Wednesday, everyone had forgotten about it. I mean, there was Netanyahu, there was Mahmoud Abbas, there was, you know, Merkel and Macron and uh, Theresa May, and they were all making speeches and, you know, gone. Trump, 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 and his nomination. So, uh, I think it. I think he, you know he. W I don't, you know, I don't. I think there are very few limits to what what he might do, and that's one of the things that really worries me. Can I ask a, a quick follow up, Roger? Yeah, there are three so, ladies right over there oh, who all want to ask questions. Just a very, very yeah. quick one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, what really explains the illiberal trend across so many different liberal democracies? I mean, if it were, if it were, uh, so what? What really explains this illiberal trend and all you know the obscenities of mm. each of these examples in the U.S. or Hungary or Poland or wherever? Uh, it, it, it's got to be more than just cultural differences or arguments about guns or whatever the issue of the day is. It's, I don't think it has to be about more than whether there's enough health care or enough, enough I uh, think, social uh, So I guess the, the question is, how corrupt did liberal democracies become? 
Yeah. You know, how, how bad was it that, whether it's after the financial crisis, that people who in the U.S. voted for Obama would have voted Yeah, for I think, I mean, uh, I think it got pretty, pretty bad. I think there were very significant failings. I think the financial crisis followed by the euro crisis, the impunity, the perception of impunity, the perception that all these recipes from globalized elites were were not improving people's living standards. It was a great, you know, I, for, for Brexit, I mean, you know, Britain is a normally prudent country. I mean, this, this sort of collective act of self-harm that is now <laughs> consuming political life in Britain and is costing the country a, an enormous amount. It, and it didn't matter if President Obama said stay in Europe. It didn't matter if the government of Bank of England said stay in Europe. It, it was a great dis disruptive cry. And it's the same as President Trump's election in a way. And, um, and I think there were, you know, I think there was anger at the impunity I've just described. I think there was frustration and uh, fear uh, from people's economic predicaments. But I think the biggest single factor probably is immigration. I think, um, you know, certainly in Europe, um, you know, when you have that whole backdrop and you have politicians prepared to play on fear and you have, um, you know, a million people uh, coming in in 2015 from Syria and Angela Mer I think she did the right thing. You know, Angela Merkel's acceptance of them and, uh, you know, Orban seized on it, uh, UKIP in Britain seized on it. And the fact is that neither Europe nor the United States has a functioning immigration policy. We don't. And, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, t I'm very favorable to immigration. I think it's the lifeblood. Churn is the lifeblood of the United States. And I think, you know, all this absurd talk of a wall is disgusting. But um, there is a problem. You know, there is a problem. In, in Europe, there's a problem because uh, there are refugees and then there are economic migrants, so-called, and there are... Uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, the population of Africa is growing exponentially. Um, the Mediterranean is not a very wide sea. There are people dying at sea. And, and I think, you know, when you have politicians, uh, and here, you know, there, there are a lot of undocumented people in the country. So, uh, so when politicians seize on that, I think it, um, you know, the specter of, 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 of large numbers of... Uh, immigrants coming to, when stirred up by politicians, when, when, when these people are scapegoated, I, I think that may be, you know, that's a very strong weapon in the hands of illiberal leaders, I think. Questions back? Um, I am disturbed. <laughs> you claim to be an optimist, and yet when asked about the future, you, you do not give an optimistic uh, speak, speech for us to listen to. There is this strong divide, yes, Democrats and Republicans. But when the young men ask about a third party, you kind of wishy-washed about that. And I think we know what happens when there's a third party. So I, w I would wonder... Which is? Well... All right, I'll say I went through Bush and uh, I can't even remember his name. No, the uh, Cheney. Forget it. Anyway, the Cheney? Bush when he got went to the Supreme Court. You know, Gore, Al Gore. Okay, and this past election, and if we have young people who are really interested in the party really does need to change. Why would we not encourage them to get busy and be a, an agent for that change for the Democrats? Because a third party is going to cause a lot of problems if change is really what we seek. So you oppose a third party? Well, I'm not for people being getting what they want and being involved yeah. in the system. Yeah. But I would like for it to be in a way that at least... Um, moves toward a system that if we can't clean up the Republicans, that we can certainly do, try to do something with the Democrats. Yeah. 
Well, thank you, madam. I think you were maybe a little bit unfair to me. I, I did say, <laughs> <laughs> I did say when asked that I thought yes, there could be a politician who could, sure. you know, yeah, that Americans sure. are decent, positive people, and if somebody you know like Obama strikes that chord, then, then that could carry such a candidate um, in a surge of support to the White House and and end and end this nightmare. Um, now you're distracted. <laughs> um, and, you know, as for the, you know, I, I just don't, I'm not sufficiently an expert on the American political system. I mean, most of my career has been overseas international. Obviously, in my column, I, you know, I feel the, the current political predicament of the United States is such I can't not write about it. But, uh, you know, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, we saw in 2008 that the Democratic Party can get really energized with a lot of young people all around the country uh, out there, uh, as they were then, working for the election of Obama. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a terrific scenario. I, I, yeah. Question from Nick Ziegler. Oh, thanks. Yes. Um, if you could say a bit more about um, the European side of this puzzle, and in particular in Germany, where Merkel faces such problems, newspapers cover uh, what President Trump does in great detail. The Frankfurter Allgemeine is plastered with stories today about the Kavanaugh hearings. My question is, in the same way that many people in the United States, of course, want to be more than passive, um, there's a strong diffusion effect uh, for right-wing parties and activists in Europe. Is there something uh, at the grassroots level that opponents of this trend toward illiberalism can do in a U.S. context that will be meaningful to people in Europe who might be observing, or is that just too fine-tuned uh, um, a, a linkage to, to have any effect. Are there people in Germany who are really looking at the opposition uh, to President Trump carefully? Well, I think, you know, Europeans, uh, yeah, they don't like President Trump to state the obvious, and they, they, are, they believe that he'll be gone in 2020. But that's because Europeans tend to focus on American, on the East Coast and the West Coast. That, that to them is the United States of America, and they're always astonished when something else happens. I think, you know, I think, um, you know, on the occasions since Trump took office when uh, the judiciary and independent judiciary has, has, has stood up and, and resisted attempts by Trump to do things on immigration, other matters, when, you know, this disgusting separation of 3,000 plus children uh, from their parents was uh, brought to an end. Um, uh, not without dire consequences. I think, I think uh, all that you know does receive uh, echoes in Europe, and I, and you know, the New York Times, we have one million or so new subscriptions as a result of President Trump, and we are, we are going. You know, people have realized that tough investigative journalism, like our thirteen thousand word piece on, on tax evasion in the Trump family. You know, these things aren't free. Keeping up 45 bureaus around the world, that's not free. Maybe it's worth, you know, a few bucks a month to, uh, you know, to support that kind of journalism. And so, and, and, and the New York Times and the Washington Post are going mano a mano on a great story with a very leaky administration uh, in a way that has not happened um, for quite a long time. And, of course, the Post has been uh, reinforced and bolstered by Jeff Bezos' ownership of the of the Washington Post. So I think in Europe, you know, when, you know, uh, certainly when I speak in Europe and speak about what's happened in the field of journalism, um, I, d I do sense a great interest in that. Um, but, you know, I think people always, you know, I think Germans are more focused on, on Germany and on Europe, uh, probably, than they are on the minutiae of what happens here in the United States. Uh, and the German situation is, is pretty, pretty worrying, I think. Uh, Merkel is, she's been a great leader, I think, but I think 
you know, to everything that comes an end, and uh, she's getting close to it, and and the far right has uh, is advancing. Gosh, questions are like. Yeah. Do you think that the third party is going to emerge in the United States with a single round election? A single, a single round, not as in France, where they have two rounds. In the first round, everybody competes. In uh, the second round, you mean can win? Uh, well, can emerge because yeah. you know NATO, for example, failed. Right. I mean, yeah. In, in yeah. But what if we have a two-round election in which everybody competes and then the two top compete in the final, the final round? You're proposing a change in the American electoral system. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I mean, Haven't we got enough on our hands? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is no chance that the third party can ever affirm itself through the electoral system. There is no chance. OK, I, I defer to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, um, so you talked before about um, the idea of like not shrugging. When yeah. Even like this onslaught of like things that um, us in the news. Right. So do you have advice about as as someone who tries to read the news and stay informed about it, how to weather all of this information and and know what's relevant and know how to comprehend all of it, even though it comes so fast, so much of. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I find as a, as a columnist, I need to like tune out sometimes just to try to think for myself because, um, you know, if I asked this people in this room to name the last six things they were scandalized over that President Trump has done, um, I mean, you could probably remember that speech I alluded to, but, you know, going back, and there have been plenty of them. Uh, uh, you know, even the moment when he was laughed at at the United Nations, it's like that happened in the 19th century, you know, it's like <laughs> way back when. Um, and no, I think, you know, I, I think it's important to, you know, to have those moments. We're all extensions of our devices these days, or our devices are extensions of us. I don't know which way around it is. And I think just to, to, to set that aside and think about you know, the issues that really, on which you want to be active, uh, that really concern you the most. And you know, I think getting involved, writing to your representative when you're, uh, when you're outraged, um, you know, taking to the street if, 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 if necessary. I mean, there's a real fight going on for America's soul. And we could have a Supreme Court now that's going to be a, a conservative Supreme Court for some time to come. And uh, so I think those forms, of, but I d those forms of activism are very important. I do think the country is very politicized. I think people are, you know, are engaged, are fired up. Um, I was observing the Colorado campaign for a while, and and uh, you know, people people who never thought about getting involved in politics are, are running there. So, uh, what are what are students at Brown most incensed or fired up about? No, why don't you? <laughs> Mike, please, can you? Yeah. yeah. As with everyone, I think. Right. Yeah. What percentage of students are Trump supporters? Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot. I shouldn't really do that. But yeah. Yeah. One. Really? Yeah. Do you think that's an issue? I'm said today there's expect a low voter turnout. So if yeah, everybody's yeah. politicized and the middle of the country is the rural guy right. who's gonna go vote? Who is going to vote? Yeah, who, who's gonna vote? My newspaper said there'd be a low turnout. Yes. I didn't see that. Yeah. I've been busy working at Brown, so <laughs> <laughs> is there And what was what was the reason given for that? They cited a, a number of people around the country who say they just really don't care. It doesn't affect their life. They're, you know, there's a lot of people that seem to be disengaged in the middle of the country. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, I, maybe the Democratic Party certainly should have addressed the globalization issues and the fact that people uh -huh. are out of work, but that was inevitable. That was going to happen. 
And I didn't see the Republican Party address that either. But right. somehow we got blamed for putting the coal miners out of work or the this, that. Right. So if people don't vote, right. that's really depressing. No, it's very, very important to, to and vote. And, uh, Is there anything that he, that, that's vile enough? I mean, every day he seems to do no. something, right? No. Is there no. anything no. that he can no. do that will change his no. base, his no. mind? People who, I mean, so every... <laughs> Every Trump supporter I've ever spoken to has absolutely no illusions about the man. They, they find him, they wish he'd get rid of his cell phone, they, they think he you know, can be pretty vile and indecent, and, um, but hell yeah, we're going to vote for him because this country needed a change and, uh, and yeah, we're not, we're not going to hand the country to the Clintons and uh, enough is enough. And, uh, so I don't think, no, I mean, well, look at the campaign. I mean, look at, um, you know, look at the, I mean, shooting people on Fifth Avenue. Uh, you know, his description of how to, how to seduce a woman <laughs> um, in his eyes. Uh, I mean, any number of things that, you know, women who have an abortion should be punished. Uh, you know, describing the, fa you know, the way he treated the father of a fallen... Uh, officer in, in in Iraq who happened to be Muslim. I mean, but when I, you know, from day one when I first went, I mean, I went to Kentucky and I guess August 2016 and spent nine days there or something. And I never met a Trump supporter who said, yeah, he's a great guy, he's a wonderful man. He's no, it was it was people are very aware of all that, but they don't care. Even we, I mean, and many many women don't care. One last student comment, and then we'll go to the reception. Yeah, yeah so you said... You like, again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, didn't mean to take How do you get a second question? <laughs> I have long arms. Uh, <laughs> student privilege. Um, I was just wondering, like, you mentioned how, like, they don't care. Uh, they need a shake-up. They need a change. Is it better for the country long-term if, like, we give... We, we let Trump, like, turn out and, like... We have evidence. Okay, nothing changed after everything that he said. You're still in this terrible situation. Is that better to like have them learn that lesson? Yeah. Are you proposing getting him reelected? So just wondering. the full, <laughs> the I'm full just, disastrous effects can be. I'm just thinking. I actually think that's a very serious. I mean, I think our republic has very strong institutions, and I'm pretty confident that four years of Trump. I mean, we won't come out of it unscathed or undamaged, but I think the country will redress it so. If I look at another six years and whatever it is, three months uh, of, of President Trump, I'm, I'm worried. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't favor your recipe of, uh, well, you know. Well, my point was, like, they can, they can look at all this terrible stuff happening in the news and they'll say, hey, like, the economy is doing great, though. Yeah. So, like, so, like, You mean wait that, for the next recession? Right. So, like, when yeah. we look back on this in 30 years, like, people are going to be like, okay, but like the economy improved and they like, despite all this terrible stuff that was happening, mm -hmm. uh, like, won't they be able to make that argument if they don't learn the lesson of like the, the, or the fallacy of Trump the first time? Yeah. Well, we, you know, we don't know. It's kind of an unanswerable question because we, we just don't know what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there could be there could be uh, a sudden downturn in the economy, or there could be there could be a war. Uh, it's not impossible. He's just threatened Russia, I saw. Um, so that would be good, right? Um, so uh, no, I, I don't agree with you. I think uh, I think the sooner President Trump leaves office, the better. We we and I will that. end with that. <laughs> I know there. <laughs> I know there are more questions. We're having a reception outside, so please join us in the reception. Allow Roger to get out to the reception rather than asking the questions here, so wait a bit. And most important, let's once again thank Roger Cohen thank for this fantastic. Sure.